Hi, Alex. Hi, Bob. How you doing? Good. Good to be on the show again. Good to have you on the show again. Let me introduce us, especially for people who may have missed the first show in which we uh, delved into your book, Quantum Mind and Social Science, which uh, was, well, we probably needn't get into that. We've probably got enough trouble handling today's topic, mm-hmm. which is going to be UFOs. Now, let me explain this. So you are a highly respected scholar of international relations, you know, political scientist. You're at Ohio State University. You wrote a book called Social Theory of International Politics, very highly regarded. Then uh, you wrote this this book on quantum, quantum physics as it relates to the human mind potentially and thus potentially to social science, which raised a few eyebrows uh, possibly uh, in, in uh, political science circles. But as if to show how unfazed you are by raised eyebrows, you have just within the last few days posted a TEDx talk on uh, calling for a science of UFOs. And uh, this comes in at an interesting time when I, I think the whole discussion of UFOs is becoming a little more respectable because of uh, some New York Times articles that, that have come out. Um, at the same time, there is a taboo, which you mention in your TEDx talk, and the good people at TED, as if to make your point for you, affix a disclaimer to the YouTube uh, version of the talk saying there are claims made in this video that are not scientifically corroborated or something, which I think is actually not true. I think, I think when, when we get into what you're saying, people will realize that um, it's actually pretty defensible. Um, you're not, you're not saying that, you know, there are extraterrestrials in flying saucers. That said, uh, you know, I only got into this uh, within the last 24 hours, really. And, and I, you know, I went and, and looked a little more into what is out there, what is kind of the credible stuff out there. Uh, read one of these New York Times articles and so on. And, I, you know, uh, there, there are certainly some uh, – I can see how somebody could, 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 could spend the rest of their life looking into this stuff. It's fascinating. So I want to eventually – talk about your take on how weird is this stuff what you think the explanation likely explanations are but first let's just um get into what you what you're saying in this tedx talk and what you're not saying okay well it's a 12 minute talk so it's a short short yep. talk and actually it's only been out six days and we've got twenty six thousand views already so it's there is an audience for this stuff. Yes. I could have told you yes. that. <laughs> well, it's done better I, I than I expected. I wouldn't say that is necessarily an affirmation right. no, of, yeah. you know, whatever, because there's some interesting yes. people out there who are fascinated by this subject. But go yes. ahead. <laughs> yes. um, so the argument of the talk is really, um, it's, it's sort of building on the release by the Navy of these videos of UFOs that the Navy used to justify their the policy change in their reporting requirements for their pilots last year. Um, and that's what the story that the New York Times had picked up on. Um, and so that was a pretty big story. And so this builds on that. And I actually use those Navy clips in my TEDx talk. And basically the puzzle of a talk is there's a taboo on this subject. Um, that's kind of strange because if any UFOs were ETs, it'd be the most important event in human history. So you'd think that the scientific community would be, all over this, but in fact, the scientific community um, either treats it with ridicule or disrespect and so on. And so I show the videos and uh, the pilots are talking in the videos. It's really amazing to listen to them. And then I make the case that we don't know what's in these videos. The Navy itself says they don't know what's in them. And so it's possible they're ETs, maybe, and we need to have a science to try to find out. And it was simple as that. So I think the uh, the thing you said at the beginning of your video that may have triggered some people at TED was when you said UFOs are real. What you meant by that is there are flying objects that are unidentified. We don't know what they right. are. Right. Um, and uh, I mean, there's actually one other thing you said that I think may have um, 
set some people off. I want to ask you what you meant by it. It, it seems to have been a joke, but I don't. At the same time, I don't know exactly what you meant. You 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 mean you said something. You referred to little green men. You said something like, "I'm not saying they're little green men." And by the way, as it turns out, they're probably gray. What did right. that mean? Well, that was a joke, um, but it's a joke in the ufology community. Um, people who claim to have seen aliens and so on. Um, they always refer to them as being gray okay. uh, in color, um, never green. And so um, if they're telling the truth and they actually saw aliens, then they're gray apparently. So, but yeah. who knows? It was, it was a joke though. Yeah. Okay. And in any event, I think the reports that have uh, given the subject a kind of a new kind of credibility don't involve the sighting of beings. Right. That's right. They involve the sighting of uh so let's let's why don't we um I know that I, I just to to um to give a foreshadowing of what we're gonna talk about, your argument is that we should actually set up a um some sort of monitoring system, uh systematic uh monitoring system to look into this further. And you're actually involved in a non profit uh attempt to uh to encourage that, I guess, and we'll talk about all that later. Um why don't we start out by reviewing some of this, um, some of the stuff that's come uh, to public attention via the New York Times and gotten new credibility by virtue of that? There, basically, I gather two big uh, sightings uh, involving Navy pilots. I think in both cases, um, one over the Pacific in 2004, one over the Atlantic in I don't know 2014, 2015, and Actually, to call them single sightings is maybe misleading because I, I think in at least one case there was a series right. repeated. Month long, month long. Now, that is, is that the Atlantic sighting, the more recent one? That's the Atlantic sighting, and it was a whole month of encounters basically on a daily basis. Okay, so describe uh, that. Both of these have been there, – there, there was a New York Times article in 2017 and one in 2019. People can Google them. The videos – some of the videos can be found via those articles, yeah. mm -hmm. but why don't you um, talk about the the one over the Atlantic? Well, it was um, daily encounters all day long for a month, um, and it, the pilots were encountering these things, and they, that's where some of the videos were taken, and the pilots report that it seemed as if the UFOs were um, trying to get their attention in a sense. I mean, they were, it was almost as if the UFOs were buzzing the pilots saying, Hey, Hey, we're here or something like that. Um, but the pilots of course, weren't drawing any conclusions about these, um, but they reported them to their commanding officers. And, and were these visual sightings or just radar or just infrared or, or what? I'm not sure. I think, well, certainly um, electronically or, or through radar or whatever, whatever they've got on the airplanes, Mm -hmm. um, and that's what's in the videos. I don't know if the pilots themselves made visual contact in those cases, but I do know that one of the concerns, the big thing that the pilots have raised that got their commanding officer's attention were the safety concerns. And the pilots have reported UFOs literally 50 feet away from their cockpits. And no one is supposed to fly that close to a jet flying at 500 miles an hour. So um, it's, those, it's the safety issues that actually the Navy took seriously. And it was the pilots who brought those to the attention of their commanding officers. Yeah. Now, I think one of those close calls, uh, alleged close calls, must have been a visual sighting because I think the, the the pilot described it as like a cube inside a sphere or yeah. something. Okay, that's right. So there must have been visual sightings if they're that close. Yes. Yeah. I guess the thing that got my attention <laughs> about four hours ago, <laughs> as, I, as I looked into this a little more, I listened to the first part of uh, the Joe Rogan podcast oh, yeah. interviewing the guy who had the encounter over the Pacific in 2004. Mm -hmm. now, this is a squadron commander, mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, a pilot. And what I didn't realize, see, I had kind of checked out the New York times videos, hadn't really read the pieces. And what you see is it's a blob on a screen Right. You know, it seems to have kind of a shape, but you're like, well, it could be a radar glitch. I mean, who knows? It, it, it's on the, you know, it, it's, uh, I mean, I actually, I think it turns out this was probably infrared detection, not radar per se. But what I realized was um, 
it wasn't just this one plane or this one pilot. The right. the um the Navy uh the uh they sent him and his squadron to investigate something that had been detected right. from an aircraft carrier. Right. And then he some of this was like visual sighting that was highly correlated not only with what um maybe was his airplane's radar whatever was sensing but what the aircraft carrier this was the princeton a, a small aircraft carrier or the uss princeton what they were seeing and and there were other pilots involved mm-hmm. and and like in for example as i understand it this guy descends you know this over the ocean he descends and gets pretty close you know a few thousand feet from this thing and it it starts moving toward him. He's got visual contact with it. Uh, and then it kind of like, you know, kind of gets, it starts moving toward him. Eventually it leaves faster than he thinks any aircraft he's familiar with could leave. But then all of this was consistent with what the, the aircraft carrier was monitoring. Right. So it's like you have simultaneous visual, uh, and from a wholly different source, radar, Mm -hmm. um, sensing of, of, of something. And, and there's just various, there's just a whole lot more data points here than I had realized in both of these events. Right. Um, and uh, it's worth listening to the Joe Rogan thing. Now, now how, how, how deeply have you looked into this? Are, are you, you're not like a UFO obsessive. I mean, how did you get interested in this stuff? Well, um, 20 years ago, in April 99, I had an epiphany, basically. My dad sent me an old-fashioned video cassette of uh, John Mack, the Harvard professor who was into alien abductions, and he was giving a speech and I was to a group, and I watched the speech on this video, and I thought, this is crazy, this is nuts. And then I realized that I didn't know he was wrong. I didn't know he was lying. And then I realized that I was ignorant. And it was the realization of my own ignorance about what UFOs are and the fact that I, as a professor or, you know, member of the educated establishment, I should know that UFOs are junk or or not real, but I don't know that. And so it was the realization of my own ignorance that has kept me going. And then in 2008, I published an article, a social science article on the topic. And then this is the, my next installment. So it's kind of a, it was a hobby originally, and it's become a serious research interest, but it's really at the fringes of my overall research. Um, now, was Mac arguing for evidence of actual kind of like alien abduction on, and that kind of thing and like yeah, the little yeah. gray men? Yes, he was arguing very, very radical, and his, he had worked with a lot of people who experienced abductions or yeah. you know, what they called abductions. So it was very, very controversial work, and especially back in the 90s. Um, and I've stayed away from that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, I've just been I've been interested really just in the physical UFO stuff, which is the most hard scientific, yeah. the most easily, uh, most easy to wrap your head around. Yeah. And I think with the abductions, there's various kinds of possible explanations. Yeah. We, we we know of various ways you can become completely convinced that you've had an encounter with a being that you haven't yeah. actually had. I know Michael Shermer, who, uh, who yeah. puts out the Skeptic magazine himself, you know, he was a cross country bicycler. And he was in a race and he was so fatigued that he became convinced that I think the team of people who were helping him were actually, I don't know, aliens or something. He talked about it uh, on my podcast with me. So you've confined yourself to this other kind of data. And in some cases, it really is data. The kinds that I've described, at least, um, uh, there's really stuff you can you can look at. So how how conversant did you become? I mean... Uh, one I'm thing I, I thought I had today was like, I can see getting really absorbed in this stuff. It, mm-hmm. It's like listening to the Joe Rogan interview with this guy. And uh, let me tell people what his, uh, if they want to Google it, just a second. The, um, uh, I'll give them the name of the uh, the pilot that they need. It's Fravor, F-R-A-V-O-R. Yeah. So yeah, how, very- um, what is your degree of conversancy and in, and in, and in, uh, in the various kinds of reports of UFOs? Well, I've read enough. Uh, I mean, a lot of the published work in this area is really junk, basically, and or just not scientific. It's sensationalist and so on. So, you know, I've read a little bit of that kind of work, but I'm not interested. 
the serious work. There are a number of books. Um, I've read almost all of those. Um, and I keep up on anything that's serious in terms of, uh, you know, whether it's radar sightings or whatever. So I'm pretty conversant in the, in the actual events. And, of course, I spent many years thinking about this and the implications of it for humanity and for, for a lot of things. So I've spent a lot of time on the side um, uh -huh. getting into this, yeah. Now, one explanation um, – well, first let me ask you, um, how much more – I, I see. I have totally ignored this stuff until, like I said, mm -hmm. very recently. Um, how much stuff is there out there that you would say, if I paid attention to it, I would take as seriously as I'm taking these two Navy reports? And when I say seriously, I don't mean uh, I think they're extraterrestrials. Could be, could be some secret government program. Could be some other. Who knows? It could be a lot of things. But. Uh, there seems to be something there. Is this, would you say that these two th things, these, the, the one over the Atlantic and the one over the Pacific are far and away the most compelling bodies of evidence, or are there a lot of things out there that, that would really get my attention if I knew about them? Well, those two videos um, are probably the most compelling visual things I've ever seen. It is the case, apparently, that the Navy has quite a few more videos, which they did not release, and they have mm -hmm. longer videos, which they did not release. So we don't know what they've got. Um, but in terms of the public domain, these videos are, I think, among the best. On the other hand, there have been a number of very famous cases where there's a fair bit of data, triangulated data from different sources, and, and scientists have written some articles about those cases that are pretty interesting in their own right, but they're more technical analyses of what what's going on and what the craft seems to be capable of and so on. So, you know, the very high quality stuff that you would expect to see in a scientific study, you're not going to find much of that at all. Um, but at this stage, that's not where we're at. We're just trying to establish that UFOs are real. And by that, I don't mean the key thing there is that UFOs are not the same thing as ETs. Totally separate question. UFOs are unambiguously real. And I would just, you just look at that video. That's a UFO period. Mm -hmm. Um, and the important thing is that the Navy, uh, presumably the Navy themselves, they didn't want to release those videos. This is, you know, a publicity nightmare for them. Um, so I think did the, the Navy... Did the, do you know how they got out? Did the Times reporters just secure them through leaks or the Navy did? Do you know if the Navy decided to cough them up or what? Well, there was, there, they, the Navy had a secret program, a very small secret program in the 2000s um, with, I think, a staff of three and I guess that program, when it wound down or that ran out of money, um, one of the members of that program went public. And I'm not sure if it was a leak or what happened, but somehow the those those videos, though, are officially released, I believe, by the Navy. And mm -hmm. they were used to justify the policy change of changing the reporting requirements with their pilots. Mm -hmm. So this was a program for studying unexplained aerial phenomena. As far as we know, yeah, there's very little details on the program. We just know it exists. We know it's over, but now people say there's a new version of it. But, of course, it's all secret, so it's hard to know what's going on. And, and let me pause on a highly technical point. Um, when you say UFOs are real, um, unidentified flying objects are real, that's actually a slightly stronger claim than saying unidentified aerial phenomena yes, are real yes. and that's because, more because a phenomenon could be an illusion it could be right. the, the 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 northern lights it could be things that that we don't think of as objects that are leaving and it could be a glitch in your radar in principle yeah. um no, i think that's right and actually uap is a more accurate term than ufo and ufo does suggest automatically a spacecraft and we shouldn't conclude that now we don't have enough evidence for that now Although looking at the videos, it looks like that could be a spacecraft. Um, but yes, the UAP is a more generic and, and a um, more accurate description of what's yeah. going on. Well, and I would say, again, if you listen to this Joe Rogan interview, I mean, among the things that lead me to think, actually, we can, uh, in this case, think of it as an actual object, um, is I mentioned some of the independent corroboration. You've got, you know, visual and you've got the separate, you know, uh, verification from the um, 
from the aircraft carrier. But another example is, and this may be the Atlantic case, but apparently, I, I take it from this interview, they would they saw the thing on radar, and then um, they have a whole separate system on the aircraft that's an infrared sensor. Mm-hmm. And, and those two things corresponded. These are like two apparently kind of separate machines, that, mm-hmm. and they're detecting different things. Radar is getting, I guess, kind of sound waves or some bouncing off of something physical. Uh, infrared is detecting heat, and 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 again, those corresponded. Right. So they're they're. Um, it, it seems to be um, not nothing. So do you have, uh, I know your main point in the, uh, uh, is just that these things should be studied, but what are your, your guesses now about the likely explanation? I mean, you must, you know, it's hard to keep ourselves from developing hypotheses and, and, and having hunches. What do you think is the deal? Well, um, it's kind of like asking somebody if they believe in God in a way. Um, I don't, I mean, I have hunches in a way, I guess the first thing that I would say though, is that my hunches are irrelevant. It could be that there's a one in a thousand or one in a million chance that these things are alien. It could be 50, 50, either way. I think we should study them. If it's a one in a thousand, even so we should study them because it, if it is real and if it's ETs, it's the most important event in human history. So, you know, I lean toward if I were guessing, and again, we have no way of knowing. So we have no prior probabilities. We have no way of assessing what is the baseline here against which we would judge the evidence. So we're really in thin air here. But, you know, if I were guessing, I think there's some decent chance that these things are alien. I mean, it looks like it on the videos. I mean, you see that thing turning, you see the one thing turning, and it's clearly got a shape. And natural objects flying through the sky don't turn like that. So well, no, but, but you can imagine um, objects being developed by the U.S. military or conceivably sure. by another nation, although it's hard to imagine another nation being far ahead of us right now technologically. Right. Not impossible. Um, but that, that's another possible explanation, right? Well, sometimes it is. But at the same time, my guess is, and this is one thing the pilots have said themselves, is that if it is secret American technology that they're testing out, they should they would never test it so close to American fighters where the pilots are actually feeling in danger. So they would test it somewhere else completely away from fighters so that they don't have to worry about fighters seeing the technology and so on. So it is possible, but at the same time, the things that these craft are reported to be capable of yeah. um, seem to be way beyond human capabilities, way, way beyond. So I, I'm very skeptical that these are secret government programs. Um, but that's you can't rule that out. Yeah. But you know, seems- this guy did um, describe, and this guy sounds super credible. Uh, and again, there's the various forms of corroboration of his basic account that are that including a lot of you know, various non-human monitoring devices. But um, the uh, and and did I say I, I forget whether I mentioned that apparently the the aircraft carrier had for days been seeing multiple yeah if i understood him correctly multiple uh objects descending right they were on this case for days before they even sent this guy out Mm -hmm. and and he thought he was going out to see something routine he and his squad they he he he, the the uh so um so there is that but 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 so i i mean i guess i if i'm gonna play devil's advocate i'd say there are we we only know very much about two cases one in 2004 one 2014 15 again uh what i didn't realize until recently is that in both of these cases it isn't just one radar system or one guy mm-hmm. it there are multiple sources right. of corroboration in both cases still it is only a couple of cases right does that not uh well i think those are the most visible and famous cases mm. Um, the French government has been studying these things longer than anybody else, and they've got a bunch of cases that they've analyzed in some detail. There are several other air forces now in Latin America who have the same policy now as the U.S. Navy, which is they've taken, they're beginning to take it seriously. But the problem is that most of the really good cases presumably are secret. Um, 
that's not making a conspiracy argument. If I were the Navy, I would keep most of that stuff secret too. Um, so, but yes, it'd be nice to have more high quality cases, but you only need a few to make the case for doing some science. I mean, th think of it this way. Human, at uh, one point I make in the video, human beings will study anything. We're very curious creatures. But yet when the Navy announced this change and these show these videos, where did the, did the scientific community come running to study it? No, they ran away. So the scientists are just not stepping up to the plate to do their job and study the stuff. And maybe they'll find out that there's nothing there and that'd be great to find out. Of course, but it's not clear, not clear which scientist's job descriptions would include this, right? I mean, who, you know, it's not, astronomers don't study flying things in our atmosphere, right? Political scientists don't. I mean, who, who, what, what discipline should, should house this, you know, the emerging well, science of UFOs? I think it's closest actually to what meteorologists do and people who study comets and stuff in the atmosphere and they have surveillance systems on the ground to monitor, you know, atmospheric phenomena. So I think that's really the closest analog. So whatever atmosphere scientists would be called or whatever the different forms of atmosphere scientists, they would be the ones who would be probably in charge of this or should be. So that leads us to the question of like, what would a monitoring system look like? I mean, tell us a little about your nonprofit. What's it called and, and how far are you along? Well, um, it's called UFO Data, UFO Det um, Detection and Tracking. So it's ufodata.net. And we founded it four or five years ago with the idea of trying to sort of create a nonprofit that would raise money and eventually build a network of automated surveillance stations to just monitor the sky 24 seven looking for UFOs. And whenever think, something comes along, the system would get triggered and start recording physical data. And the problem is, and this is what we ran into, is that it's a volunteer group. And what we really needed was somebody to spend two years of their lives writing the software for such a system. And we never found somebody, a software engineer, who had the time and the freedom to do that. And so we're kind of still at square one. Uh, we raised some money, but not a lot. So we're kind of stuck. But the good news is that another organization, UFO DAP, UFO um, Data Acquisition Project, which is based in California, it's a smaller group, but they had such an engineer. They had a, a um, software engineer, and he spent two years of his life writing all the code, and now they have a prototype. So they basically built the system that we wanted to build, and so my group now is talking to their group about how we can support and collaborate, basically how we can support their research while maintaining some independent role for ourselves. So it's a fortuitous thing, um, but this other group scooped us. I mean, it's too bad that we didn't get the scoop, um, but the system is now being tested. They have several of their prototypes out in the field, basically field testing them now. What does a prototype look like? I mean, what is the sensing device? Are these networks of cameras or what? Um, ultimately, they would be networks, at least in our conception, they would be networks. But the core of all the, all the both the other system that's actually a prototype now and the core of our idea was a so-called all sky camera, which is this camera that's pointed up sky and kind of rotates around. And then we had other kinds of sensors a magnetometer, spectrograph and other kinds of systems, all of which were actually pretty cheap. And this other group, UFO, UFO DAP, um, their basic system is maybe $5,000, something like that. So the technology is actually very cheap um, mm -hmm. and, and very, very sophisticated now at this point. But it's a, it's sky, a sky camera is the core of the system. Okay. And what about the argument that, well, this is actually a dual purpose argument in a way. Let me first deploy it by way of uh, playing devil's advocate about whether you need such a system. We're living in an age when there's just more and more cameras around and there's more and more flying objects. You know, you or I could go, I don't know, do you own a drone? We could, you could get a hobby drone with a pretty good right. camera. Um, in any event, there's more and more of them around. So you would think that um, if there's stuff out there to be seen, more of it would be coming to our attention. This is the second uh, use of this argu argument is to be skeptical about UFOs, period, right? Like, why aren't we, um, you know, uh, you know, I, one thing in the, I heard on the Rogan show is that supposedly Christopher Columbus spotted a UFO. 
Well, you can understand why in that technological age, not many people did. Uh, and even 50 years ago when you had to rely on pilots. But uh, more and more, there's a ton of cameras pointed in various directions, including more and more flying objects with cameras. So A, well, f- for starters, why isn't that an argument that we don't really need a concerted effort to build a monitoring system? Well, none of those cameras are programmed to look for UFOs. And UFOs display um, aerodynamic capabilities that are extremely unusual and will not be seen by, pro- by cameras that are programmed to look for human aircraft or human um, devices or natural phenomena. The, the cameras in, that everyone else is using are not looking for the kinds of things. That, so they, the UFOs won't even show up on some of these cameras because they're not programmed to look for that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. It is true, though, that with drones and everything else, there's a lot more stuff in the sky. So there's a lot of noise, potentially, in the signal, so to speak. Um, but drones, at least so far, don't accelerate the way UFOs accelerate. They don't take right turns the way UFOs take right turns. Um, yeah, no, but they, my, my question about drones is a lot of them have cameras. Can't we count on the certainly growing number of drones that'll just be flying around to to perform the function of the of the network you would like to build? Well, if the drones were specifically designed to look for UFOs, then maybe yeah. that would be an alternative way to build the network. Okay. Um, I think a ground-based network is easiest and cheapest. It's easier to maintain. Yeah. Um, we haven't really talked about a more aerial-based one involving drones. Um, that's something we could think about, certainly. I don't know if that would be legal. Yeah. Um, but you know, the ground-based system seems to do the trick. It's cheap. Um, so... That's so far what the consensus seems to be. Yeah, and, and then just to be clear, the second part of my argument about drones is um, that, uh, you know, why haven't we had more, wouldn't you expect more evidence of UFOs to emerge as the age of drones proceeds, even if the cameras aren't designed to do that, there's just going to be so so many cameras in the air. Yeah, and there may be, I don't know, I mean, the problem is that there is no official compilation of UFO statistics. Yeah. In the United States, if you see a report and you see a UFO, there's no place to, at least I, don't, I think this is still true, there's no place to report it. So we don't actually have systematic data even on what's happened, much less you know, high quality data. Um, but yes, over time, with more and more cameras pointed at the sky and so on, you would expect to see more stuff. But the only thing that's going to really excite scientists are going to be things that are of the quality of those Navy videos where you can really, they're just very compelling. Um, but, you know, again, I guess I don't want to, I don't think that speculation at this stage, you know, why wouldn't we see them more often? I think that question is premature. The fact is we have seen some things that are very, very hard to explain. And even if they only show up every few years, if they could be ETs, they should be studied. So I don't need a thousand cases. I just need three or four in a sense. And in any event, you're suggesting there are appreciably more cases than we've seen in, the, yeah. in the archives of various national military uh, mm-hmm. organizations. It's well, seen- I know even the, 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 this Navy pilot said, I think if I understood him correctly, that the, in the case of this one instance, there's actually radar showing multiple yes. uh, objects in formation or something and, and he said they're not going to release that, but it sounded like he's seen them. Mm-hmm. Um, the um, so um, I just so- got to add one thing here to this. I mean, I guess I would just stress the importance of the pilots. These are professionals who spend thousands of hours of their lives in the sky flying hundred million dollar machines, basically, for fun and for for work. And if they're saying that they're feeling endangered. If they're seeing seeing things that are really strange, who are we on the ground who've never flown a jet fighter to say, oh, no, you can't possibly be seeing anything? So I think we have to defer to them to some extent and take it seriously because they have no incentive at all professionally to reveal that they've seen a UFO, to sort of come forward at all. That's like that's career suicide potentially for them. So you got to give them credit for putting getting out there, getting out front and saying, look, this is real. 
Study mm-hmm. it, somebody. Do your job. Okay, so you've, you've referred to the importance of exploring this because it would, um, you know, it would be such a huge threshold in human history to find out <laughs> that there are these extraterrestrials. Um, now, there are several kinds of arguments. Um, well, well, first of all, isn't it possible? I think someone has made this argument. Isn't it possible that if ETs exist, letting them know that we know could be a bad move? Yeah, it could be. Um, and people have argued this even about SETI, actually. Yeah. Should we broadcast our existence? SETI being search for extraterrestrial intelligence, which is uh, just just looking, you know, using, uh, I don't know, space radar or whatever to, to see if there are signs of intelligent life somewhere else, leaving UFOs aside. Yeah. Right. And the key difference there, though, is that the SETI people only look for you, only look for alien life far away. Mm hmm. They, they actually refuse to study UFOs. The SETI people are actually part of the pro, part of the taboo in general because they're against UFO research. They only oh, want they? To, Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's a part, deep partly, partly because they need to convince people that they're not cranks. Right. I think that's part of the issue. It's partly a, a political issue. Maybe they honestly believe that UFOs can't possibly be alien. Um, but no, the SETIans are part of the problem as much as anything. Okay. So anyway, in that context as well, it sounds like there's been the argument that it could be what? Suicidal to let ETs know that we know or what? Yes. That is the, that is the worry. Um, that, that, that if they, so what, they would wipe us out or something? I guess. Yes. That's the, the fear. And if they have the technology to get here, then they probably could wipe us out. Um, you know, I don't take those kinds of worries very seriously, but again, who knows? And I think the important thing that comes out of these videos and the New York Times stories and is there's a conversation that needs to be had about this. Mm-hmm. Human beings need to have a conversation about what to do about these reports, these videos, and that kind of thing. Should we study them or should we not study them? And I can see an argument for not studying them because, A, they're not bothering us. Um, B, if we start studying them, it might make people upset. Um, it might be a waste of money, um, or we might alert them, the aliens, to the fact that we know they're here, and then things could go to hell. So mm-hmm. there are various arguments against studying UFOs. I just think we need to have a conversation about that in public, not in closed doors and, you know, Navy, you know, operations rooms and stuff like that. We need a public conversation about what to do about these phenomena and whether to study them, and, and then after that, what to do. Okay. And then what about, I mean, I'm not conversant in all the arguments for skepticism about the possibility of uh, ETs being involved. And again, I know you're not saying they are, but, but um, your, the thrust of your argument is premised on the idea that there's some, you know, non-zero probability right. of, it, of it being ETs. And, and I guess you also hear the argument that, you know, as, as slick as these aircraft may seem, like if you're talking about a, a civilization, an extraterrestrial civilization that can reach us from beyond our solar system, which would have to be the case, right? We can right. safely say the planets in our solar system aren't inhabited. They would be so far advanced that they, they probably wouldn't be using things that look remotely like spacecraft, right? Like, like, you know, you know, I, I don't know. I don't know exactly what they would be using, but this is a kind of argument you hear, right? Well, I think if they're, I mean, there are many different theories about what these phenomena are, interdimensional beings, you know, time travelers, all kinds of things that are pretty, mm, pretty out there. I haven't thought about the time travelers. Yeah, yeah. so there's that. And, and, or maybe they've been living here all along and, and they're just on the ocean floor because UFOs are seen going into the ocean sometimes and so on. Mm-hmm. So, there are many wild theories. Um, and, but so your point was, um, well, I mean, wouldn't, you know, it's like, wouldn't they have to be, um, if they could reach us from another solar system, wouldn't they be so far ahead of us technologically that whatever surveillance technology they use, we wouldn't even like recognize it as, you know, it wouldn't look anything like what we'd imagine is, is, is the argument. Okay. Well, if, if they are actual beings in, the, in sort of a, not if not humanoid, but actual living organisms, 
And in order to fly around the sky, they have to have some kind of a ship of something of some kind. Um, and in that sense, obviously the technology is very different. And one of the interesting things is that people who've seen these you know, UFO reports relatively up close almost always say no visible means of propulsion. Mm -hmm. There's never any sign of how these things are actually powered. And one of the theories is that these things actually, that these craft, if they're alien, they have anti-gravity technology and that allows them to zip around and do all, that would explain their ability to move around our atmosphere so easily. And also the absence perhaps of propulsion technology and it would help explain how you get from star to star. So anti-gravity technology is the key speculation that would explain a lot of, of what's what we see. Yeah, apparently it would also, if I understood this Rogan thing correctly, it would also explain how the craft could go in and out of water readily, which apparently is right. a recurring yes. report uh, yeah. uh, in, the, in the archives of the military. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and is consistent. Uh, well, anyway, this one guy's thing, I mean, he cited it. It was like right above the water. Um, yeah, I didn't understand what the anti-gravity technology would be, but he did say that in this case, there were none of the kind of heat signatures you'd associate with conventional propulsion. And they did get into something about anti-gravity um, propulsion, which I guess is uh, apparently a known possibility, even if it's uh, not something we've harnessed. Right. Yeah. Um, have you thought about, I mean, I assume you, you, if you've been thinking about this for this long, you must have gotten a little into the kind of, um, the, some of the philosophical questions mm -hmm. associated with, uh, extraterrestrials, like, can we infer anything? I mean, if we assume that they, uh, well, A, that they exist, but B, that they that they they emerged from a planet that, like ours, had some kind of system of biological evolution, and they pass through something like and since since biological evolution tends to create animals that are pretty good at fighting each other, um they they they, they may have passed through a phase of conflict such as the human conflict we're in, mm -hmm. uh, such as the stage that we are in. Um and and even uh, maybe a, a phase where technology uh, uh, combined with conflict perhaps threatens to like blow the whole thing apart. Can you infer anything about the nature of beings that got beyond that? You know what I mean? Well, this is a theme that comes up in the, the discussions about the Drake equation, which is this kind of model for how do we think about how, likely is or is intelligent life in the universe and so on and one of the variables in that equation is exactly what you were just talking about and um you know the fact that civilizations may reach a certain point and then blow themselves up in effect with their own technology so mm -hmm. they have to get past that phase as you were just saying and you know my assumption is that any civilization that if there is such a phase of conflict that they get past it they're probably peaceful and my guess is that if you're zipping around the galaxy monitoring primitive civilizations like ours, if they wanted to conquer us, they could have done it a long time ago. Mm -hmm. So I don't think there's any, and there's no sign of these things being hostile. Um, doesn't mean they're friendly. And it could be that they don't care about us at all. They might be here for the rocks or who knows why they're here, right? It may have nothing to do with us humans and we just may be an annoyance in the way. Um, so there's an anthropocentric quality to the whole discussion here, like as if they're here to see us. Well, maybe, but maybe not. I guess that leads me to another question. Um, presumably, they would not have, it wouldn't take them that long to decode our language, you would think, right? Like, if they're out there, they're picking up the sound waves, and I mean, I mean, um, they must, they would think they've got excellent remote sensing technology. Right. They can pick up the structure in human language. You would think that they would have an AI that can take pretty much any language and, and, uh, well, I don't, maybe not. But anyway, you, you would think that it wouldn't take them much more than decades to acquire the ability to communicate with us if they wanted to. Mm -hmm. and it's like, why not? <laughs> well, this is something I've thought about a lot as a political scientist. And I think um, 
because everyone assumes that, well, they would just land on the, if they came all this way to see us, they would obviously land on the White House lawn and say hi, right? Right. Um, and actually, I think that's very unlikely because if they, if they are real and they, if they've done this before, then they probably know that if they landed on the White House lawn, there would be panic in our entire society. Um, the stock market would collapse. Governments would lose control. People would start going crazy in the streets. People would commit suicide. I mean, all kinds of bad stuff would probably happen if they just showed up out of the blue. So my own guess is that if they are here, what they're doing by kind of probing our pilots constantly is they're uh-huh. sort of trying to get us used to the idea slowly that they're here. Yeah. And then once we figure out that they're here, then they might want to talk to us. So they're waiting for yeah. us to figure it out. They may even have a betting pool on board their ship saying, one of these stupid humans going to figure out that we're here. They've yeah. Been signaling this for 70 or 80 years and they're just not getting it. So who knows, but or it's maybe, all speculation. Or here's a theory. It wasn't Russian meddling in the election. It's, it was extraterrestrial <laughs> meddling. And the idea is to get us used to it being the, to get us used to seeing scary beings on the white house lawn. <laughs> I won't comment on that. Perhaps okay. A, a I was just, I'm, it's a joke. It's a joke. Yeah, yeah. I, don't oh, I, Trump, I don't want any Trump supporters coming after me. That was a joke. Um, so, uh, yeah, I've always assumed that, that if there were ETs that could reach us, they would have to be relative to us kind of morally advanced. They wouldn't just like kill us for fun. I think that's probably right. I doubt they need us for nutrition. Although, you know, there is that Twilight Zone to serve man. You've seen that one, right? Yeah. And there's the movie Soylent Green, which is yep. sort of similar. It's so. a cookbook. The, uh, now, but there is also, uh, have you seen The Day the Earth Stood Still? Um, maybe a long time ago. Well, there the idea is, I think. Now, if, if actually, this leads, <laughs> I realize we're getting pretty far afield uh, from your main mission. But... Um, there is uh, uh, one reason they could, uh, in principle, want to make their, if they had good intentions, they could want to make themselves known to us be, in, the, in the knowledge that that would likely draw the nations of the planet together out of fear of them, right? Now, I think that is a theme of, uh, there's an episode of The Outer Limits. Do you remember that show? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Where people actually fake uh, uh, the landing of, of an extraterrestrial to scare the nations into uniting. And then uh, the day the earth stood still, I don't remember exactly how it works. I think maybe there they come and deliver the explicit message, like get your shit together, get rid of your nuclear weapons kind of thing. Mm-hmm. I, I forget. But y- 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 you think they'd figure out a way to make their presence known in a way that didn't totally freak us out. And then, and then tell us to get our act together, right? Well, and I think that, I mean, if they do appear at some point, I think it will instantly bring human beings together and, Amer- and the governments of different countries that would immediately work together, I think. Mm. Um, and I'm sure the aliens have no interest in kind of working with some humans but not other humans or working with Americans but not Canadians or something. They're not, they're not going to care about any of that. We're just a bunch of humans. Um, so I think it would pull people together. Um, and I think their intentions probably are good, and I think they're just slowly warming us up, in a sense, to their presence. But that's just personal theory. And again, all I care about is, let's just do the science. We, don't, we can speculate all we want to, and that's fun to do and interesting, um, but let's just do the science. And the puzzle to me is, why haven't we done the science? We study everything in the world scientifically except this. Yeah. There's something that's scary about this that scientists just won't touch it. And that's what's interesting to me as a political scientist is that the politics of this is so um, difficult um, for people to wrap their head around, I think. Well, I think, yeah, it's an interesting question what's behind this taboos. There are various taboos um, in the world. Um, There's this, I mentioned on another podcast, right now there's this uh, controversy. There's a certain amount of documentary evidence that WikiLeaks has brought to our attention that the Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons kind of, um, uh, you know, doctored a report about the Duma chemical weapons attack to suppress the skepticism of some some people on the actual inspecting team as to whether there had been a chemical weapons attack. Mm-hmm. And there's a there's kind of a taboo. I understand that taboo. 
I mean, yeah. I, I don't, I'm not saying I think it's a good idea. I just understand how, what the mechanics are by which you're going to get shouted down as either a conspiracy theorist or an Assad apologist or both. Mm-hmm. If you, if you um, try to highlight that, I understand why, in that sense, why that taboo exists. I guess uh, it's an interesting question uh, with the ET thing. I mean, is it maybe that until the Navy released these things, it had been so much easier to dismiss or what? So you're asking, why do I think the taboo exists? Why do you think the taboo exists? Yeah, I, well, this is the subject of this article that I wrote in 2008 with my former advisor, Bud Duvall. Um, and our thesis, the puzzle is, you know, why is not nobody studying this? What, what's the issue? And our answer was that um, the modern state, modern sovereignty is completely based on humans. In, in ancient times, you know, gods had sovereignty or nature had sovereignty and humans were kind of low on the totem, uh, totem pole, so to speak. Nowadays, in modern times, we're the sovereigns of the planet. We own the planet. Everything is ours. We're the smartest beings on the planet and everything else. So the modern state is based on the assumption that there's nothing besides humans that's relevant to politics. Mm-hmm. Um, and so human beings have no choice but to pledge allegiance to their state or some other state. Um, and if you pose the question, well, what about UFOs? And you allow the possibility that those might be alien civilizations, then suddenly you open up a question that governments don't want to have open. They don't want people worrying, wondering, maybe aliens are here, because if aliens are here, are your citizens going to pledge allegiance to the aliens? Or are they going to pledge allegiance to your state? You're probably going to go with the aliens because they're way more powerful. I, I, I welcome, I for one welcome our new alien overlords. <laughs> So I think it's the, the nature of the modern state is the problem. It's based on an assumption that only humans have sovereignty and there can't possibly be anything else here because that would undermine the state. The state can't ask the question without undermining itself, in a sense, yeah. is the pieces of the paper. I mean, there's and, also a legitimate government concern about people panicking and freaking absolutely. out. Absolutely. Yes. Um, I, I, that's something that I, as a political scientist, also worry about, that um, if this were – you know, became, if it happened too quickly, um, then there could be, it could be really ugly. It could be really bad. Yeah. End of days and everything else. I mean, people could go crazy. So. Okay. Well, I know you got to go shortly, but so I guess maybe the final question is about you. Like we've been having a, you know, free ranging conversation. You've indulged my hypotheticals seemingly unconcerned about how your answers could be taken out of context to to show you as as somebody who's like sure there's ets or something which isn't the case but but um you you seem relatively unconstrained by self-consciousness and certainly uh the decision to do the the tedx talk suggests the same and for that matter as i suggested so does a whole book you spent many years on about quantum physics and social science, because you knew very well that some people in your discipline were going to say, looks like he's gone off the deep end, even with that, right? Right. What is it about you? Uh, have you? Have you pondered the fact that you seem to be different from many other people in terms of your willingness to be misperceived as a crank? <laughs> I said um, misperceived. I said, yeah, mis- yeah, I know, I know. Um, no, I have thought about it. And, you know, my dad was an academic. Um, I'm from a long line of academics. Um, and I think I imbibed the, the naive view that, and I say this at the end of my talk, that the, the first job of the academics is to tell the truth. And the truth is we have no idea what UFOs are. And I think the truth in some ways is my shield I'm not claiming that UFOs are anything in particular. I just know that UFOs are real, and that's the truth. And I challenge anybody to tell me otherwise and make a convincing argument. So it's partly that. And it's also the fact, thinking about my own career and so on, that, uh, well, I'm at a stage in my career where I can take more risks, certainly, because I'm older. Um, But it's also that I have the best job in the world as an academic. And I think if you have the best job in the world, then say something in your job that other people can't say or won't say or, or don't have the ability to say or are too afraid to say. Say something, put yourself out there, mm-hmm. and stir a conversation, generate a conversation. And so that's my view, and that's what I tell my grad students, too, not to go as crazy as I have, obviously, but to say something that, that matters 
and that people might talk about um, and that somehow justifies your existence as having this fantastic job that we have. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a personal responsibility thing, which I probably got from my dad or you know family or whatever. Um, but I'm sure I'm not the only academic who feels this way about their work. And um, But I have been willing to sort of take more extreme positions on things. But again, on this UFO thing, my position, I think, is the logic of my talk is it's very sober. I mean, I don't think I'm saying anything in the talk that's, if you listen to the talk, there's nothing in there that's really that controversial. No, it's interesting, though, how readily people, when there is a taboo, how right. they err on the side of caution. I mean, you do say in the talk, you say UFOs are real, and then it is it is several minutes before you get back and explain exactly what you mean by that and don't mean. So there's that, but you would think 12 minutes that it's not too much to ask the people at TEDx to spend 12 minutes listening to a talk before putting a disclaimer on it. Yeah, the disclaimer, well, the disclaimer, though, is the perfect advertising for the talk yeah. that I think generated more views than the talk itself might have. The comments in the comment section are all trashing the TED people for the disclaimer. The disclaimer, it makes no sense at all. It's, it's literally incoherent. Um, it's almost laughable, really, I think. And so I'm glad. It, I want to just look at my notes and see if I had anything else I wanted to say in particular. Um, yeah, I guess the other thing, I, I did want to say one other thing, um, which is that, in a way, the premise of, of, that emerges out of all of this is that human beings might be today in a pre-contact situation, the way uh, Native Americans were before Columbus came and so on. Mm -hmm. And if we're in a pre-contact situation, the, the interesting question is, well, how do you prepare? What do you do in that situation? Do you, what do you prepare for? Do you try to establish contact? Do you try to avoid contact? Um, and I think that's just a really interesting problem. And I don't know how governments think about this, but that may be the situation we're actually in. And maybe coming to grips with that and talking about it is the way to proceed. I just want to what, have a conversation. On the other hand, what can you do? I mean, if they have hostile intent, we're toast, right? We're toast, yes. We are definitely <laughs> toast, yes. <laughs> unless it, unless just as a logistical matter, it's hard for them to get enough force. Like maybe they can, like maybe each spaceship can only kill a few million humans and they've only got a dozen of them here. That's, uh, let's be hopeful. Yeah, that would be the hopeful scenario, right. Um, so, but yeah, but uh, do you have any ideas about how we would prepare? Well, I think the way to prepare is to start talking about it and to break the taboo. Okay. I think the taboo is cracking now. The Navy mm -hmm. videos the, and the stuff that came out of the Navy, uh, the New York Times stories, my video, other stuff. I think the taboo is cracking. And mm -hmm. I think this may be another case like um, gay marriage or you know marijuana prohibition. There are other cases where public opinion has changed very rapidly in the mm -hmm. West. I think this is, I think the tide of public opinion is shifting. And it's very interesting if you read the comments on my video, almost nobody goes after the argument of the video. Mm -hmm. There's no skeptics out there saying this is all wrong. There's, I suppose, a few people who are critical, but the comments are overwhelmingly positive. Um, and no one has raised an argument against what I've said. And, and I think that's because what I've said is actually pretty obvious. It's, it's very, it's hard to argue. I haven't said anything that controversial. All I've done is say, let's look at this and study it with science. Yeah. Well, in closing, I just want to ask, um, and this will, uh, our, our, our audio podcast listeners can't appreciate this question the way those watching can, but what is that being on your chair? <laughs> that um, is a joke from former grad students of mine. Uh -huh. And uh, this is supposed to be an alien. This is what they look like, but they're not blue. They're usually gray. gray. We've, yeah. we've established so, that. Yeah, we established that the aliens are gray, and this is supposed to be a gray alien, but somehow the people making it decided it should be blue. So my grad students thought this would be a fun gift for me, and so I've kept it in my office all this time. And um, he doesn't do much. He just kind of sits there, but uh, he's sort of an well, inspiration. So far as I'm concerned, he is performed his function today <laughs> yes right that's, uh that's great tv well thank you alex um are, are, are there places people can you want to send people to look at your work i mean we will link to your ted talk and people can google it it's on youtube um it will link to the new york times video uh and the two new york times pieces 2017 and 2019 uh, what about your own stuff twitter feed anything you want to 
I don't have a Twitter feed. Um, I'm on Facebook, but I guess the only other link would be to my original article from 2008. Okay. Although it's a very academic, it's, you know, it's written for social scientists. So it's, it's kind of very dense and jargony and stuff, but um, I can send you the, the link for that. Possibly that might be worthwhile, but you know, I think just watch the video. Yeah. Um, and, and then think about what is being okay. said. Well, thank you very much for having me on the show. I'm delighted to be able to kind of, present some background and context to the video um, because I only have it 12 minutes and stuff. But um, although I discovered in the video that I have this annoying tick, which I never even knew I had a speech tick. I say MK all the time, which is you you say what? I didn't notice. You say what? You say MK or it sounds like OK, but it's not really OK. It's MK. And I never even knew I had this tick, but I I didn't notice it. it. Yeah, I saw it 25 times. Somebody pointed it out in the comments and then I saw it in the video. I said, Oh, wow. I do have this text. That's the so. trouble with comments. People have said worse things about me than uh, <laughs> than that in comments. Believe yeah, me. Well, it was weird to notice that and so on. But um, but it was hard. The talk was hard to do, actually. And um, took two months to put it together. And um, but it was fun. And I'm very glad that I did it. I mean, you know, this is not going to help my career in the slightest. Um, but a, I'm just really glad I did it. It's the beauty of tenure. Yes, yes, absolutely. Okay, well, thank, thanks again, and we'll, we'll check in down the road, maybe. All right, thank you, Bob. Okay.